oh, that pain is from the, uh, the arthritis that I was told I got 10 years ago after the injury. Instead of just, let's not call it anything. Let's just listen to the whole story. And so that's one of the most important things in my mind. And so when it started, how slow or fast, or if it's gone up and down, how that's happened, what that, what's that changed, what's the, the pattern of the, of the weakness. So is it in your hands, is it in your arms? And sometimes it can be very, very hard to figure that out. And so that's where I get to sit down and listen, and I, I like to hear, well, you know, I, last year, you know, um, we, I, I put all the, uh, all the cereal used to be up high, and now I put it down low. And, and, and uh, we can figure out why you're weak because of that. But maybe it's something really subtle, like that, or, or I always try, this is one of my go-to questions is, is, do you have a favorite chair in the house that you like to sit in? And, and invariably that starts a conversation of how they stopped sitting on the couch because they could never get up off the couch. But they like the chair that's you know in the kitchen because it's got arms on it and they can push up on it. And so it's really trying to think of how you can describe your weakness because I, I can only imagine how difficult it is to convey your, your, your weakness or your symptoms. Pain's another great example of how to convey uh, pain, and I think it just takes sitting down and, and just kind of discussing it and, and thinking about it. Um, so that's one thing that we do. The other thing we do to make a diagnosis is to do a, an exam, so a physical exam. And, um, and, and there are limitations to what we can do on a physical exam. Um, as, as many patients know, um, they sure feel weak doctor saying, well, you're not all that weak in that muscle. And, and I, 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 I never want to convey that I, I'm doubting that someone's weak. It's just from that objective measure that's helping me put the whole thing together, um, you know, I, I may not be able to detect weakness in certain muscles. Um, and then the other tests that we have are the electrodiagnostic tests, so the EMG nerve conduction study tests. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, so, so maybe actually one thing about that test. So um, we don't we don't like to torture our patients. <laughs> that's not that's not why why we why we do it. And and it's not why there. So there are some tests that the doctor just has to do themselves. And and unfortunately, the electrodiagnostic tests or EMGs are one that. The doctor is putting the needle in and doing the procedure, and as he's doing the procedure, he's interpreting the procedure. So it's not like sending me a, a, an MRI test, or it's not like me looking at a blood test. It really is doing the test and interpreting the test at the same time. So, so, um, so having it be repeated, I'm sure, is nothing fine, but, um, but there is a reason for it. And the other test often we use is a muscle biopsy. Um, and so whenever we do the muscle biopsy, um, it, it, uh, it depends where we get the muscle from. So you gotta remember, we're only taking a teeny piece of muscle, but you have muscle all throughout your body. And so um, figuring out where to take it from, sometimes we take the wrong muscle. Not that we take, not like a surgeon does the wrong Side or something. It's just that we take a muscle that isn't effective, effective, and isn't informative on the muscle biopsy. And so you may hear, "Oh, your biopsy was normal." Well, it doesn't necessarily mean it. It just means that that piece of tissue that we took was was normal. We may have to repeat it. I don't know if people had have, have repeat biopsies before. Yeah, and so that's something we don't want to do. But, but that's that can lead to a diagnostic journey. Probably all of you have experienced. And then the other tests that we do are certain blood tests. And, and, and we're getting better at having blood tests that can be more sensitive and specific for certain diseases. But you have to remember with any blood test or with any test, and, and any test at all, there are, there are false negatives and false positives. Just because you have a positive blood test 
does not necessarily mean that you have the disease that corresponds with that positive blood test. Because if we were to go out and test the blood test in a thousand people, you know, a small percentage of them may be positive, yet a thousand people don't have myositis. You know, that many people don't have myositis. So, so I think thinking about it, about it that way. And so that's where it takes putting the whole picture together. So listening to the story, doing an exam, doing the electrodiagnostic tests, getting a muscle biopsy, and looking at blood tests, and putting all of that together. And that's kind of how I think about things, and that's about that's how the, the um, you know whatever the title was, you know, what kind of, how do I know I have this diagnosis? That's that's all the pieces that we kind of put together. Does that does that help? Make sense? Does anyone have any any questions? Okay. Um, I was seen at Johns Hopkins, and I, I had all the EMGs, um, spots, and all that, so it was positive. But I live in Illinois, so Dr. Mann sent me, that was when he was at Johns Hopkins, sent me to Wash U, sometimes closer to where I live. Um, and the doctor there, um, I don't know how to put this nicely, but he, um, he just wanted to do everything all over again. So why did they do that? Because I, I refused, because I was already diagnosed, and I didn't feel the need to go through all that all over again. It's exactly the, it's, I don't trust anyone. And, 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 and maybe that's bad, but, um, but we don't do it to, like I said, to, you know, someone, if we're talking about a rare diagnosis, something that maybe only a handful of people have, and to call somebody that, out, um, it, it's up to somebody else's interpretation. And so um, if you go to, to Mayo Clinic, they're going to repeat everything. Granted, they're going to repeat everything conveniently in two days, um, but, but they're going to repeat everything. Did you go to, to Mayo Clinic? And, and I, did, they, did they repeat everything? They the biopsy. So yes. hopefully they didn't say to repeat the biopsy. They did. Because, because they didn't see anything on the biopsy? Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to answer. So I don't know for sure. But we want to see the tissue. So I, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to. I don't know. So, so I, we typically, like Linda said, we would not. Um, if, if the biopsy, so we'll say that they did the biopsy. The biopsy didn't show anything, or we were confused. Or we would get the tissue. If the tissue didn't exist, then that's unfortunate. We get the slides. Um, at Wash U, we actually like to repeat all the tests on those slides. So it's not necessarily repeating the biopsy per se, but repeating all the tests. It's possible uh, many people have to have a repeat biopsy because um, because they don't see whatever features they need to see on the muscle biopsy. Maybe the day, so yeah. you've been reevaluated, and I don't think of it as being reevaluated. I think of it as somebody looked at you with fresh eyes again. Like it's just rethinking about you. And in fact, when I see a patient come back in clinic every every four months or every every year, um, I do this with Linda. I just rethink about it. You know, I just, it's just an opportunity to look through the whole thing again, listen to the story. My guess is patients look at me like I told you this a thousand times. But that's not what it's about. It's not about me not remembering. It's me. It's about me. Rethinking and just you know putting it all back in perspective again. So for me, with the biopsy, they just asked for the biopsy slides, <laughs> so he could talk about it and look at them. And but they didn't really have everything. Not all of them. It's just a few. I think more for genetic studies because they I mean, right. yeah, I sent them referencing it, so they could use them. So, so yeah, so that's that's kind of I, I, I don't know the, the ins and outs, but, but that's the thought process.
really dotted in the bombs. Uh, medical practice there is just the bone, cut the head off the chicken, poke the silver, give them the rag doll type technology. Um, have not had a biopsy yet. Uh, finally left the bombs, went up to Canada, uh, one through 12 doctors. Uh, eight of them did not even know what I did. I walked out on three rheumatologists who had no idea. Been told it doesn't exist. Been told, you know, everything else. Um, hoping to get a biopsy and a doctor that actually understands it. Because, you know, I, I don't think the people around here, but that's what they have. You can't get out of head. Also, you know, I'm starting to notice the throat. Um, so I know what they have. I'm also a bad. So, you know, I've got a little bit. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's been a problem, is just finding the doctor who even knows what it is and is willing to, you know, lose a few months because he's not missing 10 other patients and then they can while he's spending an hour and trying to actually figure out what you're doing. So, I mean, I think you bring up a lot of different points. So access to care in this country is not, uh, is not the same for everybody. So I, I don't know if anyone knows uh, how it works in, in Europe for something like myositis or for muscular dystrophy. Every patient, so in England, every patient with myositis will go to the exact same center. So it doesn't it doesn't matter. Okay, if you're seen by your primary care doctor and you're suspected of having uh, a neurological problem, you go to see a primary neurologist, and they finally send everyone to the exact same center and there's different centers for different things and so is that good or bad i don't i don't know the answer to that, that um you know it, if someone doesn't you know doesn't want to travel or can't travel that would be difficult so so, so i mean i think you could bring up well, it's easy in canada you know it's right So you, you know, I, I, I don't like to say this, but it's true. I, you, you need to be your own advocates. You really do. And I really, really want to empower patients to be their own advocates. And if something doesn't smell right, go somewhere else. If you've got, you know, my, my comments to my patients often um, are, if, if, you know, I always ask if you have a primary care doctor. And, you know, do you, do you like that primary care doctor? And if they have a neurologic problem or they've got myositis, is that primary care doctor the kind of primary care doctor that says, well, that's probably because of your myositis. Why don't you ask your, 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 you know, your neurologist about it? That's not really fair. You know, if you get short breath, you get short breath because you've got a heart attack or a pulmonary illness or, you know. So, I mean, you've got to have everybody working together. And it's not me saying, don't call me with your problems. It's me saying, Everybody on your team has to be comfortable with saying, I, I, can, I can work on this, or say, you know what, you're not the patient for me, I can't. And, and, um, and that can be hard. Um, I, you know, I have patients that are undiagnosed, and I guarantee they do not like to hear when I say, I don't know what you have. Um, I mean, Linda's a prime example, I, can, I, can, I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know. I know you've got something. I can I can call it something. I'm happy to call it something. Um, I can put it. You know, I can say it's myositis. But as you learn and meeting each other, there's more than one kind of myositis. And so you know, so, so that's the, that's that's one of the challenges. And so um, you know, I I like I said, I feel like I have a luxury. I get to sit behind a, a large academic university and. I say I don't know, no one's going to be like he doesn't know what he's talking about because I've got the credentials. But, and so, but, but the doctors on the community should be able to say, I don't know what you have either, and, and feel okay with it. And so, so yeah. Yes? Uh, I'm going to ask you to describe the country too. So, we don't get to go to a big, so, thank you. I'm just saying, Australia is a very big country too. So, we don't get to go to a big myositis. Center either, and our diagnosis is 
long time coming with very few doctors who um, know, first of all, that you've got something, then where to send you. So credit to all of the doctors who do work together and who do have um, some wonderful knowledge, courtesy of being able to go to wonderful medical conferences and places, especially like this, where you can all get together and chat about stuff. So in Australia, we have 125 diagnosed people in our organisation. TMA was My Service Australia. And uh, for my question to you is, given all of that kind of background, I want you to define the difference between polymyositis, diagnoses, and why it's not dermatomyositis. Okay. You can do that. I, I'm going to try. You're going to try. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, so, um, so there's, there's a large, so, so, um, I, I'm going to answer that question. But I want, to, I want to give one more bit of context, which is that these, these are new diseases. It's not that they're new diseases, they've been around for centuries, but we've just started being able to diagnose them. So inclusion body myositis wasn't identified until 1979. Polymyositis, there was a huge debate. There's actually a paper, it's a classic paper, which is called Polymyositis and Other Undiagnosed Unicorns. Okay, so that was only in 1990 that people were still saying, I don't even know if this thing really exists. So, so, so I, I want you to know that, um, that, that you're, you're on the cusp of something, of, of a new disease, and, and not just this. And I don't want to say a new disease because I don't want you to think that all of a sudden, you know, everyone started getting it. it it's been around, but it's been called, you know, other things, and, and I'm sure you guys have other diagnoses that weren't myositis at, at many points. Um, so I think I think it's because of that. And so um, I think we're still refining the diagnosis, which probably leads to your question, which is, well, what's the difference? Because I'm so confused about what the difference is, because one doctor will say this, and another doctor will say this. And that's because the diagnoses are really evolving. And so um, and it depends on who's making the diagnosis. So there are some doctors, and some excellent doctors, some doctors on the, on the, the myositis advisory board who would say that, my, that polymyositis does not exist, that that's not an entity, that it's dermatomyositis or it's different forms of myositis, but that polymyositis by the original defined criteria, which is, you know, it's going to sound funny, but it was Bowen and Peter, two guys, who decided in 1980 that, that, that they were going to come up with what the diagnosis of polymyositis was. And so these are two guys that with their clinical experience, which is probably vast, but still not decades worth, decided what polymyositis was. And so that's why these diagnoses are being revisited. And I think it leads to a lot of patient confusion. And so, you know, the classic definition of dermatomyositis would be skin changes so dramatic, you know, skin changes along with muscle weakness and inflammation in the muscle. However, many people with polymyositis have skin changes. And so um, you might be saying there, well, that doesn't make you know, any sense. Why aren't they called dermatomyositis? It's because then other people say, well, we should focus on the muscle biopsy features. And we should diagnose you by the muscle biopsy features. So you've got a clinical diagnosis. Look at you and I examine you, and your features are skin changes and muscle weakness, dramatic. Okay. But then, then I can have a pathologic diagnosis. So then I can take a muscle tissue from you and ignore what you look like, ignore that you have skin changes, and look at just the muscle biopsy. And now all of a sudden I look at it and say, well, you know, it has features that we see in patients that have dramatic sense, but it also has features of patients who have some. Polymyositis. And then it can make it even more complicated. I can ignore the patient, so no clinical definition. I can ignore the pathologic definition. And I can just go with a blood test. And so more recently, we're moving toward different antibody testing and different antibodies putting us into categories. And now, something that I always thought was dermatomyositis, which was GO1 antibodies, I don't know if anyone has GO1 antibodies, but there's GO1 antibodies. I always thought I had dermatomyositis. Actually, there's a lot of patients with joint antibodies that have no skin changes. So now I've got to re 
re-change everything. And so I think that's the, the confusion in, in, in different uh, physicians, as I said, even on the advisory board, different physicians um, call it different different things. And, and I don't know, I don't know how to answer that the right way, other than um, I think uh, trust and openness to the physician, um, you know, as, as hard as it is to develop a relationship see them once a year, but to be able to, to develop that so that, so that I can say to you, you know, I, I know I'm confusing you and calling it this, and I know that this other doctor called it this, but this is why. Um, and I think, you know, I, would, I get more uh, worried at, at kind of the hard line, you know, no, you don't have that, you know, and then maybe you have a little bit of everything. Would inclusion body mass size be included in that too? Saying that the same kind of thing. It's Yeah. So, so inclusion body mass size um, typically happens in patients that are older, and so um, we, we go through the same. Uh, there, there can be uh, actually this is another example. So, so, so people can have features of inclusion body mass size. And, and, um, and also features of polymyositis as well. And, and in fact, there's an, an entity. So, so, so I guess the other thing to think about um, from a doctor's standpoint is, is um, doctors are, we are in two camps. There's groups of doctors that lump. So they just put everything together, okay? Myositis, dermatomyositis, polymyositis. And they've got four buckets. Or there's a group of doctors that are splitters. And so they then take dermatomyositis and turn it into dermatomyositis with you know, um, interstitial lung disease, dermatomyositis with Joe and Pot. So, so now that they're splitters. And so they would say that, that everyone is their own unique disease. From a, from a patient standpoint, I can see how that's confusing. From a research standpoint, Splitting is fun, you know, it's thinking of new ways to make new diseases and think about different diseases and, and to say, well, everyone who has these features, what, what do they look like? And so from that standpoint, splitting is good. From a treatment standpoint, splitting may not be all that helpful and lumping may be more helpful because people in this group respond to this type of therapy better. So I think, I think that's where we start thinking of what diagnosis do I have and why we hear this in spectrum. Um, and, and for IBM, we're starting to do splitting again. So we're starting to say that there's different types of, of IBM, people that have a certain antibody that's positive with their IBM, people that have certain biopsy features that are present on the IBM, uh, on, their, on their muscle biopsy. And, and I guess when I say treatment, I also mean uh, therapeutic trials. And so it's not, for some clinical trials, it may not be that helpful to split down the disease so that only 10 people in the world have it. And it may be better to lump for a clinical trial so that we can understand. So, so the, for inclusion body myositis, um, the, there's many different diagnostic Many that take into account a clinical, so what you look like, your pattern of weakness, pathology, and take in the pathology, and, and also take in the EMG. And we call that diagnosis clinically, uh, clinical pathologically defined. And that's, the, that's the purest diagnosis of IPA. That's the purest diagnosis. However, not every patient has all three of those criteria. Does that mean they don't have IBM? That doesn't mean they don't have IBM. And the reason that's important is because if I have a drug for IBM, does that mean I can only give it to this split group, or do I need to broaden my diagnosis? So now, <coughs> the trials for IBM, we also take a clinical diagnosis of IBM, which means that you didn't have all the features on muscle biopsy, but you clinically, when I say clinically, again, it's listening to the story and doing the exam. 
clinically look like Adderall. And, and, and including those in the, in the clinical trial. And the reason is, is, is I mean, because we want to treat more patients. So it's, it's very clear. Does that help? So that's, that's a great question. So, um, as I said earlier, you know, seeing a patient at the end of their diagnostic journey um, doesn't necessarily mean that everyone missed it in the beginning. It's exactly what you said. Maybe there weren't features on their biopsy earlier. Maybe their antibody titers were low and not detected. And so, when is it right to revisit? You know. I revisit, I, I, would, I wouldn't repeat, so, so what is it right to revisit? It's definitely right to revisit if something changes. So, so, why, so why would somebody come and see me? Uh, so let's say, we di let's say I diagnose somebody with um, uh, enclosure myositis. There's no current therapy for it. Um, why should someone come to see me every six months? And so patients ask me that all the time because some of them live far away and, and they want to know what's the point. And in fact, I get told many times, all you do is tell me I'm getting weaker. And, and why should they come and see me? And I, I think the reason to come and see me is so that if something goes out of the norm of what I think the progression should be, then we need to be ready to revisit the diagnosis. Because the last thing I would want is I, I may not be right. I may say that you have IBM, I may put, that's my best guess at that time of all the clinical information I can put together. And, and I tell patients this, I say, I've got, I've got a couple of different tests. I've got uh, my clinical exam, I've got the EMG, I've got the muscle biopsy, and i got this other test, it's called TIME. Okay, and no one wants to hear that. That's an awful test, but it's true. I, have, I get to wait and just make sure that you follow the disease course that I think you should follow. So what is the diagnosis is if, is, if, um, is if you see a dramatic change, something changes, um, and, and, and to continue to, to follow with somebody, and if they see a change, be ready to, to, to revisit that. Um, the other reason to revisit a diagnosis is if, is if a therapy is available. So um, if there ends up being Another immunomodulating drug that comes to market that people are starting to use in a certain type of myositis, it might be worth thinking back and saying, let's just make sure you have what we think you have, um, and, and um, that before we start you on something new. So, so that would be the other the other reason. Um, and I, you know, I think it's I think if something doesn't feel right, it's okay to revisit the diagnosis. I'm not sure. Doing another muscle biopsy. So, I, so there's some tests, and this is going to sound not nice, but there's some tests I don't think are that big a deal. Okay? I'm obviously not getting them done to me. So, an EMG, to me, it's low risk. You're not going to die from it. Um, you know, you're not gonna, it's, it's not going to have a fatal outcome. I agree, it's not comfortable. I, you know, to be honest, I've never had one. So I, but, but to me, I know I should. Uh, that's all right. That's I got I'm gonna say here. When I come back next year, if you guys ask me, I, I will go and get it done. Okay, I'll have someone practice on me. That's my commitment to you guys. Okay. What? Okay, now I get it. So I should have you guys. So I think that's uh, doing another blood test, not a big deal. Doing another muscle biopsy, I think, is, is a big deal. And so I, I would want to know how is this going to change um, the management. Okay. 
and, and, and the other thing is, is um, you know, sometimes I'll tell patients, well, I'm not sure doing this muscle biopsy is going to change anything that we do, but it might give us more answers on what the diagnosis is. And some patients will say, oh, you know, I've been living with this for, for 10 years, and you know, if, if you call it something else, it's not changing anything. Some patients want to know, and that's awesome. Like whatever, that's where it's a conversation. If a patient wants to know, we'll push. Linda Weaver wants to know. I mean, we've done lots of things that I normally wouldn't do, and she's she's one of them. She's you know, we talked about them, and, and as long as they're low risk and, and, and they're not out. Of so the other one I don't want you to do is I don't want you to get tests that are going to break the bank. Okay? So 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 you know you guys have you guys would rather travel here. Like you have other things you want to do with with, with money. And so um, so yeah. So so that would be another thing to think about is if, is if these tests and revisiting the diagnosis is going to not be covered or, or something like that. Yeah. Have you ever diagnosed uh, necrotized myopathy? Sure, yes. And how does that differ from the other diagnosis? Yeah, so 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 this is where we get to it. So you're describing a pathologic diagnosis. So that's what, so sometimes, so that's a biopsy feature that you're necrotizing myopathy. No one would be able to look at you and say you have a necrotized myopathy. I might be able to look at somebody and say they had dermatomyositis because they had skin changes and weakness, but I wouldn't be able to, so, so that's a pathologic diagnosis. And so um, that can, um, uh, classically, you know, the, the differences in that disease are that um, it, it is, is usually a, a little bit more uh, rapid in its onset. It can cause, um, one of the muscle enzymes is much, much higher, so the CK, much, much higher because the, the muscles being um, eaten away at. The, the main things about some of these things is that um, there is an association in necrotizing myopathy and other types of myositis. There's an association with malignancy. And so um, patients with necrotizing myopathy can have associated malignancies and people need to be screened for that. So, so that's another action. In my mind. So if I can do a biopsy and find your diagnosis, or I can revisit your diagnosis because I might say that you're at an increased risk of cancer, then, then, then that's a win-win. And, and I need to do that, and then we can, we can screen you. And typically, if somebody has myositis, and, and they have myositis, and they have an antibody, like an antibody called MI2, for example. Say so they have an antibody for MI2. MI2 is associated with malignancy. And so for the next two years, so first off, they need to go see, if they're a woman, they need to go see their gynecologist. If they're a male, they need to get a prostate exam. They need to be up on the colonoscopy. They need to be up on screen. In addition, I would do a hand scan. So I would scan them, uh, chest after call the CT. And I would do that, um, what I would say is aggressively, which means that's not aggressive. They have to do that once a year for two years. And if, if it's negative, the data suggests that there's no cancer associated with it. And so, so those are actionable things. So that's why we're finding the diagnosis. So that's why you know, developing new diagnoses has prognostic implications. So we have, we, have, um, we have diagnosis, we have prognosis, and we have treatment. Those are the things that we want to understand for every patient. And we're getting at better diagnoses. Prognosis, I'm sure every one of you doesn't feel like you have a clear prognosis because it's hard to know. It's hard to know how someone's going to progress and we just don't know that they can. We can do prognostic associations or do you have cancer? Is there an association with cancer? Is there an association with something else? And then treatment. So um, many of the biopsy features and antibody features can help dictate what type of therapy someone might respond to. So someone with an antibody positive may respond to B cell mediated therapy. So B cells are what make antibodies. Someone who doesn't 
they did not respond to much to it. That doesn't mean we wouldn't try it. I mean, that, this is where it becomes very gray. When I, when I, um, this is another classic, uh, somewhat euphemism, but is that, that in, in this uh, medical arena of myositis, it's more of an art than a science for many of the different treatments. And that cannot be comforting for many people to think that, that it's really just, you know, um, trying different things to see what works and that there is no clinically, you know, uh, it's not like a, a, a trial that's been done um, for, for heart disease, okay? It's, we just don't have that type of luxury. What well, the disease is fairly the disease is fairly minimal in numbers per billion and it's fairly new. But the people that I've talked to here and many, many have gone through many numbers. What is the medical profession doing to educate, you know, the GPs all the way up that this even exists? Because so many of them even deny it. Says, no, you, you get no. No, I can't get out of the chair. Oh, no, just, you didn't exercise. Right. So I was actually just talking about that with John there. Yeah. But. So, so, um, so then the question is, you know, how are we um, in, informing people? So, so one thing I can say is um, is that advocacy groups like like the My Science Association um, are are good at getting the word out. So they actually, I don't know if you guys know this, but they 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 pay for me. To go give talks at medical schools so that we can talk to, to all levels about myositis. And so really increasing awareness is, is, is one way of doing it. So just letting people know that myositis exists, that it's complicated, who you need to send somebody to, um, that, that type of stuff. Um, yes. No, no. So that's Um, so, so that's that's one step. I think that um, that uh, you know primary care physicians are on the front line, and you, you have to think about uh, a primary care physician. And if someone comes in and they're limping, the first thing they're going to think about is hip, lower back. You know, they're they're going to think common things common. So they're going to think, and so I think that that. We as patients, and I guess I should say you as patients, um, need to, to also educate as well. And, and, and like I said, if something doesn't smell right, don't you know, if you're if you're walking and you're like, it's not in my head, it's just not, it's it's, it's here, you know, or, or whatever. And, and using the language that I think that they can help. So so saying it hurts. My least favorite thing that a patient says, it hurts. That means absolutely nothing to me. When did it start? How does it hurt? Why does it hurt? So thinking about it ahead of time, what makes it better? What makes it worse? Those are questions that we want to know the answers to. I really want to know, uh, I ask patients, like, what can you do? Well, I, I, I can do whatever I want. No, 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 no. You're here because something's wrong. What is it that you can't do? So being able to convey we can't read somebody's mind. And if, and if they, if, if all they say is it hurts, and, and, and I say that with um, knowing in, in my heart that it's hard to convey those types of things. And pain in particular are feelings that you've probably never experienced before, and there aren't even words to describe some of the symptoms that you're having. So I, I get that. And so, um, if thinking about it as you're talking with your, your partner about it, or talking to friends and saying, does this make sense like I'm explaining it well, really can help. I think frontline physicians can really help. Because then, because then they can say, well, I guess it's really that you're actually you're right. It doesn't hurt when you bend over, it only hurts when you do this. And so I think I think guiding them a little bit is, is one. I think the other thing that we need to do is not just um, uh, as physicians. Um, is, is to change our mindsets, okay? As you get older, it is not expected that you get weak. That's just not, that's not an expectation. 
Um, you know plenty of older people who are stronger than me, okay? So clearly the default is not to get weak. And if someone's getting weak as they get older, if someone falls and, and, and is tripping, that's not because they're clumsy. We need to rethink that and say, you know what, maybe there's something wrong. And you might say, well, who cares? That doesn't make a difference. Because we don't have anything we're going to do for those people. Well, we are. We are in the next 10 years. And, and we are going to have therapists for these types of things. If we don't identify them early, if we don't tell our family members, if we don't say, you know what, I know Grandma said as we get older, we get weak, or as we get older, we just all start using a cane. Not true. Just not true. Truth. And so if we keep saying that, it's going to be propagated to the younger generation and it's never going to get lost. And physicians say it too. Physicians will say, hey, you know, you're just getting older. You know, I, I think you just got to accept it. You have teens. They, they want teens. <laughs> right. So, so it doesn't mean we're going to find something. I, I'm not making a false promise that we're going to find something. But you asked, how can we increase awareness? And it's the first conversation out of someone's mouth is, well, that just happens when you we just that closed the door to the conversation. Okay, so it, it, at least saying, well, let's 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 listen and hear. So, so I think those are really huge challenges. I'm going to give you another example from the dementia field. So everyone's into Alzheimer's these days, and the goal is to diagnose it earlier and earlier and earlier. And and I don't think the belief anymore in my mind. I hope my kids don't believe this. That as you get older, you lose your mind. Not true. I don't think anyone believes that anymore. Okay? You know, if you, but, but the other problem is, is how do we let patients know that it's okay if you're weak and you might have something going on? It's okay if you can't pay your bills anymore. You know, don't ignore it. Let's get you to the doctor and see what's going on because while it may not make a difference today, there's going to be treatments for these types of diseases and getting them diagnosed earlier and earlier, not having the social stigma around them, all of that is going to be hugely important. Uh, one thing, I had a question about the MRI. Um, you know, we'll do, I don't know how we do that, but I asked why they took that and they said, well, I see patterns of weakness in lots of muscles yeah. that are associated with certain so we're just starting to do, um, it's actually, it's a little bit um, crazy the way MRI, so MRI, so over in Europe, um, where I don't have to get insurance companies to okay things, they order MRIs all the time, no questions asked. And so they've been diagnosing myositis and other muscle diseases for, for the last two decades using MRIs. And I can go and I can cut on you, and get a muscle biopsy, I can do all these different tests with no one asking me a question, but I can't order an MRI without getting it okay by the um, insurance company. So that's part of the reason that in the U.S., um, how many of you have had an MRI in your lower extremities? So, so very few. In, in, in Europe, almost everybody. And yours was on a research basis. Right. right. Yeah. And so, um, so we're learning that we can, we can uh, it's, again, it's another splitting. Maybe somebody has polymyositis with this pattern of muscle involvement on their MRI that might predict that they have a different disease, a different prognosis, or respond to a different therapy. So we're just starting to, to learn that. Correct. Correct. And not only that, um, there's there's um, well, how many people, so whenever you get an MRI, they do different sequences. So there's a thing called a T1, a T2, um, a STIR, a T2 star. So they can do different types of, and each one of those gives you different information. Some of them give you information about the structure. Some of them give you information about water content. Some of them give you information about fat. And so it's not just which muscles are affected. It's also what kind of pathologic involvement is there. So it's possible someday that MRI will replace the need for muscle biopsy. Um, you know, talk about changing the doctor's mindset. That would be very hard for me to, to believe that um, it is possible someday that can happen. <coughs> Excuse me. I wonder, just because you 
talk a little bit about IBM and these other things and how that work is distinguished. Um, are there, would you mind listing other things that a knowledgeable person, a neurologist, might still have a hard time distinguishing? From IBM, I think you've said poly can be hard to distinguish, and then maybe the advertising from myopathy. I wonder if there are other things. And then is that MRI, like in my case, the only thing that's been mentioned that hasn't been done is an MRI. So trying to think about those things that should still be ruled out and whether an MRI would be additive to all these other tests. Right. So um, so so we can do this for other other ones too. So for IBM in particular, um, you know the, the things that can so you're asking like what can look like IBM that that you should make sure you don't have. It's kind of is that what I'm curious or? Okay. So I mean so um, so, so one thing that can look like IBM is, is ALS, okay, so Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, it should be, that should be, a doctor should be able to tell you if you have one or the other. If, if they haven't told you that, you need to go see another doctor, okay? With that being said, not everyone follows the rule, there are cases of a mixture of the two. But at least the doctor would say, hey, fall into this weird category. So, so if you haven't heard definitively that, 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 that and in fact, for any of the myositis, if someone hasn't told, so, so it's hard for me, so I'm going to tell you as a physician another, another thing. It's hard for me to know what a patient's thinking, okay? And if a patient is coming to see me, and they want to know if they have ALS, and even, even though we never talked about it, even though it's in the back of their mind, say, hey, do you think I have ALS, or, or do you think this is multiple sclerosis? Like, if, if, you have, if you just want to know what you don't have, like, we're awesome at telling you what you don't have, okay? <laughs> like, I can tell you what you don't have. I, I'm not as good at telling you what you do have. And so I often will ask a patient at the end of, of the visit, you know, are there worries that you have that I can just take care of this second, you know, that, that this is, you know, ALS? And, and it, maybe I'll say, well, I don't know yet, but now that you told me that, the next time we talk, we'll be sure to address that. So, um, so, 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 so ALS is, is one thing you would be worried about. Um, and, then, and then different types of, of myositis. The main thing with IBM is the one thing that we never want to miss is something that's treatable. Okay? And so, is this myositis or is this, is this a treatable form of myositis, like polymyositis or, or dermatomyositis? Is, is the main question that someone with IBM should be asking is, is, is this a treatable form? And, um, and although we say that IBM is not treatable, um, often in conversation with the patient, I will, um, if, if, if they want to try something like steroids for a period of time, remember I try steroids, this is just me. Um, when I try steroids, um, it, we, we try it hard, try it for a good period of time. Because the last thing we want to do is give you steroids and have you say, well, oh, it kind of worked. I don't know. Do you think it worked? Because I gave you only five milligrams or because I only treated you for a week. So if I have a conversation and somebody with IBM or any my size, and we want to see if something works, we're going to try it. But knowing that the goal is not to keep you on high dose steroids forever, Goal is to see if you have a therapy, uh, an immunomodulating drug might be a benefit to you. And so, um, and so often I will try somebody with IBM on um, on corticosteroids for a period of time. That's another part where I think patients can really help. So I always, if I start someone on steroids, I always say, hey, let's talk right now about what you can't do now that you want to do and that we think that the steroids will fix. Like, let's come up with an idea right now, because can I tell you the worst thing for any therapy for immunomodulating is whenever someone comes in and says, I don't know, I, I, I think I'm a stronger, I feel I'm not tired. I, I, I don't know what that means. Or they'll look at their, their spouse and say, what do you think? You know, I don't, I can't read your mind. And so thinking concrete, you know what, I can only walk around the grocery store, you know, 
for, for 50 feet and then I had to sit down. But actually, the last few months, I've been able to go all the way around the grocery store. Oh my gosh, that's so helpful. That's so helpful. And so those are the, those are the kind of things that I, I may not be able to tell just by looking at you how you can improve. So, so really, it's conversation. It's, 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 it's letting, letting us know. Um, sure. Are you aware of any sort of symptoms? So I'm going to rephrase it and answer it in a bunch of different ways. So, so, um, so, so I, although I'm saying I want you to bring in, you know, uh, a thought out, how you've changed, how something's improved, I don't, I don't want a huge notebook. Like, it just doesn't help me. And, uh, and so, um, and, and, I, and I know that that's how some people work. I'm just telling you why. It doesn't help me. To do that because then it's too much information. So I like to think of, of, of you know, are there are there focus things? And so, so I like to think about functional things. So can you get up out of the chair, out of the bed, better? Now I listened to you and you said that's not an issue with you. It's a much higher level of thing. And I don't know the answer to that. That's very hard. I agree. Um, it's very hard to um, probably to you know when you're still really active. Um, where's where's the, the change in the delta there that you can convey? So I can see how that can be hard. I don't have a clear answer. Um, uh, the the uh, you know I, I think that uh, that someday um, we will um, hopefully. You know, there, there are now trials out there to look at Fitbits, okay? It's everyone knows what a Fitbit is, right? And can we use that type of information to understand, um, you know, disease progression, but also disease intervention? And so, um, but we're not there right now. And, um, I don't know what I would do with any of that type of data. I mean, the... Um, you know, there are, there are, for patients, you know, there are antibodies to measure, there are CK levels to test. Um, so there are things that can, that can help. Um, I guess my only other comment then is also, um, many patients have good days and, and bad days. Okay? And, um, and, and um, what's, what's it, what caused a good day, what caused a bad day? Okay? And, and I see this all the time where a patient racking their brain, trying to figure out what they did the day before, what they ate, what they did, what someone said to them that made them have a bad day. When the truth is, is they're just going to have good days and bad days. It's just going to happen. And there is no problem. And people come in and say, I can't drink Gatorade, I can't drink, eat oranges, and I can't do this because I have bad days. And, and you're just like, no, no, that doesn't, that's not, make sense. Gonna, so, so, and the reason that's important, I'm going to say the reason that's important is because often we'll give patients a medication, something like uh, Neurontin or maybe even an antidepressant, and they'll take it and they'll say they had a bad week it was because of that medication, and all of a sudden that medication is off the table for the rest of their life. 
because they think that they had a bad week without reflecting, saying, hey, guess what? I have good days and bad days all the time. I have good months and bad months. I can, I can go 20 miles one day, and I can only go five the next, and I can't figure out why, but it probably was because of this fault of that. So, so, so just, I just want to, I'm not picking on anybody, I just want people to, to think about that. And, 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 and what that does, as far as my then arsenal of health, because if you took it for a week and you had a bad week, and, and now, like I said, it's off the table forever. Now I can't prescribe one of the drugs that I think could be helpful for you in the future. Do you have another drug that you'll use if prednisone is someone who just cannot tolerate prednisone? I've been on it for years, and it's turned the world upside down. So, um, so I think this is a great topic to talk about, is, is how we decide what drugs to use and, and how we think about prednisone. So, so um, prednisone gets a bad rap, okay? And, and, um, and I think, I think it, it appropriately gets a bad rap. However, I think there are times when it's appropriate, and I gave you one example, which is where you might try to give someone prednisone for three months to see if they're going to respond. That, that's uh, appropriate. I think you're going to hate those three months. Um, you might gain weight. You might have high blood pressure. You may be on a slight scale of insulin. I don't know. But that's not the goal. The goal is not to ruin your life. The goal is to see if you respond to steroids. Chronic steroids. So, so um, it's, it's a different story. And so um, often if someone's going to respond to steroids, and they seem to respond. So this is where it gets difficult. I need to have the patient convey to me somehow that they responded to the steroids. You know, not just a wishy-washy, well, I, I feel a little, a little bit better. You know, that you clearly responded because then I would then start trying a nasty immune modulator, something that could have some bad side effects. Um, not that steroids don't have bad side effects, but something that could, um, uh, that, that could potentially increase your risk for, for lymphoma, something that could cause problems with your kidneys, something that could solve problems with your, um, with, your, uh, with your liver. Prednisone, as soon as you stop the prednisone, all the side effects go away. These other drugs, once we give them, there could be, so, so that's part of the, the reason. So, so making sure that, that, you can, that you can weigh that, um, because I don't take transitioning somebody to another drug. Like. It, it potentially could, but often people that develop diabetes on prednisone are, are just on the edge anyway. And so while we say it induced it, um, you know, there may be other lifestyle things that need to be done. And Will it lower um, you know, your, your need possibly for insulin use? Will it lower your dose of glucophage? Most likely. What's that question? I'm sorry, I'm going to finish up. So, so the other types of medications we, we try, so I don't know if you're going to say it, it becomes more of an art than, than a science at some point. So um, usually we try, you know, some hypnoran, try um, something even more aggressive. Um, the, the issue is, and, and, um, is that my first job is to do no harm, okay? That's what we say. And so I don't, if somebody is up and walking, and I, I never want to minimize somebody's, you know, um, feelings. Like, I, I'm not, no one's trying to minimize them. It's just we need to think about the trade-off of trying something or cyclophosphate. These are chemotherapeutic drugs that can have nasty consequences. And so, um, and so, so there may be some of that. Yeah, come back to um, 
And he said, maybe sometimes you have to revisit a diagnosis for different reasons for that. And you know, maybe do an EMG or some other test again. Um, what if the patient is on steroids already, and so there might not be inflammation? Can they still see something in those different tests, even if they're out of medications? Right, so that's a great question, and I should have brought that up. So the things that can confound a muscle biopsy, one of them is being on steroids or another immunomodulating drug, so um, absolutely. So um, I, I would not take it lightly. If someone seems to be on steroids and seems to be responding to steroids, so, so that's the two things. So you're on steroids, and the steroids are working, then I don't think I would on steroids and you're like, I don't feel any different, you know, they just put me on it. And that's what doctors would say, you know, I don't really feel any different today than I did, you know, six months ago. Then I might say, well let's go off the steroids for three months and then we buy So so that would be so so the issue is you know you, you wouldn't be looking for a new diagnosis of the steroids would work very well. Um, is how I kind of think about it. Like, if they're if they're working then they don't So I thought it would help with industry what I do to help communicate with my uh, team of physicians. So I have tremendous myositis and I have multiple comorbidities all the way down to you. A bunch of space and a common variable in the efficiency that I have for 30 years. So it makes it very complicated to treat me with a lot of And then and get that picture to the team of how I'm doing. So I'll share something. That's great advice. So I think um, when, when I so so one thing to think about, and it, it does tell us onto this is is if, if we start a medication. So I just told you if I start steroids, I'm not looking for a change for three months. So what does that mean? That means you have to look back two months ago and see how you felt and compare that to this month. Okay? I don't. I'm not thinking about how you're doing this week compared to last week. For me to make treatment decisions is really thinking about how you're doing, you know, are you better this month than you were two months ago? And, and that's exactly right. It's probably, we don't remember those things. Um, and so, so that's a good way to kind of reflect back. Um, and that's good for many different medications. Even, um, so you mentioned stress makes things worse. So even, even things like an antidepressant or 
things like that, which I'm, you know, well, why do we prescribe antidepressants? Well, like I said, my arsenal is not that big sometimes. And you guys are wanting treatment for something that I don't even know what it is. And I don't have very medications for it, but, but I do know the data for antidepressants, and they're, it's good data, okay? It's stigmatizing, you know, yes, you know, you're on an antidepressant. It, it, it works, and, and so um, that's another example of where thinking about how did you feel three months ago compared to, to this month can be, can be helpful. I'm her sister in her number, and I, she's in a lot of pain all the time. And I know that polymers have this, this, you know, weakness, but could there be something else going on with her that they haven't discovered because she's in a lot of pain? So, so I think pain in, in myositis is underappreciated. Uh, and I think um, I think we don't fully know why it happens, um, and and so um, I never want anyone to be in, in pain. Um, but but it, it can be hard to, to to treat. So is it is the pain uh, because of the myositis, or is the pain a consequence of having the myositis? So. Um, it may sound like the same thing, but it's different. Is the, is the myositis itself causing the pain because it causes pain? Or is the myositis causing you to walk differently, to sit differently, and now all of a sudden you're putting strain on muscles and on tendons and on ligaments? The way I think about it is you know, God built us to walk a certain way. And if we get a little bit of weakness, in, you know, I, so I sprayed my ankle a month ago. I got more pain in my back, even though I, I you know, because I had a splint on that wasn't allowing my ankle to bend, and you just start walking different, and you put more pain, and I got pain on my shoulder, and I had no idea why I got pain on my shoulder. And so I think that, that, um, that, that, um, that's where I say, it's, it's be, is it because of my sinus? I don't, I don't know, and I don't think you know the answer to that. Um, it's not a huge leap to believe that if you have inflammation in your muscle, that you have inflammation in the tendons, that you have inflammation in the connective tissue. And in fact, we know that there are many mixed connective tissue disorders that also have myositis. So, so I think you absolutely can have, can have pain. Um, with that being said, it, it means that we likely need to take a multifactorial approach. And so um, physical therapy, although um, someone wants to hear that, that physical therapy can help get your body in a more neutral position with walking, with sitting, can build up strength, they can detect strength that is weak in one you know, antagonist muscle versus um, other muscles that allow you to, to, to be in a more neutral. So that would be one thing to do. Um, the physical therapy is not going to fix your pain you know, in the next week. Um, and so the goal, my goal is for my patients is, is there's many goals, but, um, and there are short-term goals. But my biggest goal is that someone will live an independent, wonderful life for the next 15 years. And if doing physical therapy on a regular basis can maintain function for 15, 20, 30, 50 years, um, it, it can be hard to keep that in perspective. The other thing is, is using pain medications. Um, so I am a big believer empowering the patient. I don't live your life. I don't know when you have pain. And I'm not sure it's even helpful for me to know if you have pain at this time of day or that time of day. What's important is that you know when you have pain. And so whenever you take pain medications, to understand how the pain medications work and to take them at the appropriate time. So are you having pain constantly throughout the day? In which case, a medication like Normontin or Lyric are you having pain at the end of the day once you get off your feet and you're laying in bed? 